So we ended the last video, part one of chapter seven, talking about activities. And we introduced something called an activity cost pool. And I said you can conceive of that as a manufacturing overhead account for that particular activity. It, it doesn't quite work that way. I want to be clear, but you can think about it that way. Well, when we think about activities, we have five levels of activity that we can identify. Number one, unit level activities. And these are activities that are performed each time a unit is produced. So the activity happens at the level of the unit. So the unit is the cause of a cost. Another unit, another an incremental cost. Another unit, another incremental cost, etc., etc. So overhead expense, it's basically overhead expense that varies with the number of units. So we can think of a lot of things that, that, uh, that vary with the cost of a unit. So let's say we're looking at a machine press that presses out uh, something in a piece of steel and, and it just keeps doing that. Well, those machine presses, every time that press happens, there's a surge of electricity. So every, every unit, we can trace the electricity of that machine to each unit made. In other words, if it wasn't making any units, it wouldn't incur any electricity costs. But because it's making units, it, occurs, it incurs electricity costs, there's cause and effect. We can think about it as batch level activities. And a batch is just making a whole bunch of something at one time. Batch level activities. And these are activities that are performed each time a batch is processed, regardless of the number of units being processed. Good example here is machine setup costs. So if you have uh, have to make 50 units of something or 500 units of something, you'll still have to set up the machine for that particular job. It may be different than the last job that went through the machine. One can think of a printer. Every time a printer has to print off a new job, they have to clean the rollers, re-ink the rollers, and, and, and send the... Uh, uh, and send the product through. There is some setup time for the job, whether they're printing 1,000 flyers or 20,000 flyers. So the cost occurs at the level of the batch, not the level of the unit. So overhead expense varies with the batch instead of the unit. So we've moved up one level from unit level to batch level. We can move up one level higher. The next level would be product level costs. And we can start thinking in terms, you know, pretty much we know what unit level and batch level is, so product level must be costs related to specific products, regardless of how many batches are made and regardless of how many units are in each batch. Costs that are related to the specific product. So it's overhead costs, or at least we're trying to find overhead costs that vary only with products. In other words, the product is the cause of the cost, not the batches or the units. Here's a good one. You have to design a new product. Well, all that design goes to a product level overhead cost because it doesn't affect batches or units. The design is of the product, not of the batch. You don't have to redesign the product every time there's a batch. You only have to do it once. So design, the production manager for that particular product, uh, advertising for that particular product, and some of you out there will say, wait a minute, advertising is a non-manufacturing cost. Remember, we already talked about this. Some non-manufacturing costs can be considered product costs only for ABC accounting, only. And we're going to see how this helps us make better decisions. Then there's customer level activities. Now, I'm not a big fan of this one. I'll explain it later on why I don't like tracking, tracking costs to a customer. Anyways, these relate to specific customers or customer segments. The cost of serving a particular customer or a particular customer segment. They cannot be tied to any specific product. So if I'm a customer that buys only a specific product, just a specific product, then it wouldn't make any sense to do this. Or if there's a cost, let's say a commission on sales. So I buy a particular product, there's a commission on sales. Well, that commission is tied to that product. It's not tied to me. Do you get that? It's not tied to me. It must not be tied to any specific product. Otherwise, it's a product cost. So a sales call, mailings, 
Technical support. Well, they may not be tied to any one particular product. They're tied to supporting the customer as a whole. And support, I'll talk more about this later on, uh, I'm against ABC uh, costing out support to customers. I'm absolutely against that and I'll explain it in a later video why this is a very dangerous, dangerous thing to do. Finally, we have organization sustaining activities. And these are costs that are incurred regardless of the other four activities, regardless of the customer being served, regardless of the product uh, being made, regardless of how many batches are run or how many units are made. They're costs that would be incurred anyways, regardless of any of this stuff. So we can think of the CEO, the secretary for the CEO, the depreciation on the office building. You can't trace depreciation on the office building to any customer, any product, any batch, or any unit. Because even if they all changed, even if you completely changed all your customers, all your products, all your batches and units, you'd still have that depreciation charge. So there is no cause and effect. Nothing of those first four causes that cost. So we can think of cause and effect as our acid test. In deciding whether something is unit, batch, product, or customer level, we can ask, well, what causes this to happen? And that will help us. But as we will see when we move forward into designing a system, that is not easy to do. It requires a deep level of knowledge of the type of business you're operating. And even when you do have that level of knowledge, there's still going to be incredible disagreement as to, no, that's a product cost. No, that's a batch cost. No, that's a product cost. So it is not easy to design one. So we're continuing on with, uh, uh, we're still on, on number three, looking at the differences between traditional costing and process costing. And we're just trying to position ABC. We've talked about the activities now. Now, before we continue on, I just want to give a warning out uh, here about ABC. Um, it is not always useful. There are times, I'll give you a situation or a continuum, we'll draw out a situation where ABC is the least useful and where it's the most useful. And you'll find that in many cases, it's not even worth doing, really. So let's think of this big box as our costs over the years. And uh, we'll look at some trends. Uh, and I'll draw out these two lines. This is in your book, by the way. But if we look at the left side of this chart as being maybe 50, 60 years ago and the right side being today, we can look at the breakdown of direct labor, direct materials, and overhead within a product. So that uh, sort of today, we have a greater share of overhead in total product cost because of the move towards automation. Well, that requires overhead, whereas 50 years ago, 20% of the cost of a product might be overhead. Today, it's 50%. And ABC costing is about allocating overhead. So if overhead is very, very small portion of the total product cost. It's not very useful, right? But the greater overhead becomes as a percentage of the total product cost, the more useful it becomes. So here's where it's least useful. You make a single product that is sold to a homogenous customer. In other words, every customer is the same. There's no differentiation between the customers. They're all buying a single product for, for a particular reason, and that's it. A homogenous customer where volume, the volume of what you sell, and things like direct labor hours, direct labor dollars, or machine hours are highly correlated. So if you're making one thing, selling to a common type of customer, and your volume and your direct labor hours or your machine hours are highly correlated, ABC is least useful. It is the least useful. Here, you're looking at process costing. And very, very rarely, in fact, I'd say almost never, would you find a company using process costing also using ABC because it's not useful. It's the least useful. It is the most useful when you make a variety of products. And not just a variety of products, but a variety of design or engineering intensive products. Why? 
because design and engineering are an overhead cost that are not considered as manufacturing costs. They're non-manufacturing costs. Well, if you have a product that you're making that requires a lot of pre-design and engineering, they're not captured in inventory. Those costs are not captured, but they're part of making the product. You make a variety of design or engineering intensive products of varying complexity, and you sell to a number of distinct customer segments. Now, I've just described a business where ABC is most useful. And that's a continuum, by the way, from least useful to most useful because there is a cost to implementing this and a cost to maintaining it. If the cost is not worth it, don't do it. Yes, it'll give you better information, but you have to weigh the, the benefits of saying, look, it'll cost us this much for, for, for information that might be a bit better. Well, don't do it, right? So you'll find it in situations where job costing is the primary costing system, plus ABC is used as a supplement to that. So now that we position that and, and explain that, listen, don't look to ABC as the answer to everything. It's just, it, it, it can be useless for some companies. Let's look at the last difference between ABC and traditional costing. In traditional costing, recall, we calculate our predetermined overhead rate by taking our estimated manufacturing overhead costs. Notice I'm not saying overhead, I'm saying manufacturing overhead costs. And dividing it by some cost driver, some activity base, whether it be direct labor hours, direct labor dollars, or machine hours. Well, all of this may only represent 60% of capacity, let's say. It may only represent 60% of capacity. So all the costs that you, that, that you incur are divided by an activity that may only represent 60% of capacity, but you're charging 100% of the costs. So what happens? Cost of goods sold and inventory will carry 100% of capacity costs, even though your allocation base is only 60% of your capacity. Can you start to see the, the disparity there? There's an extra 40% of costs in products that, that will skew the price of those products. So for decision making, your products look like they cost more than they actually do, but your costs are because you have idle capacity, not because your production processes are too expensive. Now, while this is proper, it's proper practice for external reporting, that is the proper way to do it. By the way, charge even your unused capacity must go into product costs. That's a proper way for external reporting. It may result in poor decisions. The closer you are to capacity, the less this matters. If you're running at 98% capacity, this doesn't really matter. In ABC, this is how it would work. You have your costs that you incur, whatever they happen to be, you have your costs, or your costs that you estimate, and 100, you'll estimate 100% 100 of your costs, and then you'll start saying, okay, some of these costs are unit level, some are batch level, some are product level, and some are customer level. Now, that's a hard thing to do, by the way, to figure out what goes where. But you only have to do it once. Once that's done, the, machine, the, 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 the computer system will run itself, right? But let's say you add up all those costs that you apportion, and you've only apportioned 68% of your costs. Of all the costs you incur, some of them are units, some are batch, some are product, some are customer, but you can only apportion 68%. The other 32, you're going, I don't know where to put this. There's no cause and effect. Well, that 68% represents incurred capacity costs. That means capacity that you can trace a cause and effect to. The other 32% may represent unused capacity costs because there's no direct cause and effect between unit, batch, and product or customer. So there are some costs that you cannot assign to any of those activities, so you assign them to a category called other, other activities. And we call these period costs. Ah, look at this now. They're not product costs anymore. They're period costs. So unused capacity does not show up in products. It shows up as a period cost so that you can make better decisions about what products are or are not profitable. Thank you